anytime now. Can I start? Uh, sure, Divya, go ahead. And, uh, okay. Thank you, Lord. Um, thank you, Father, for uh, this wonderful time that you've given us, Lord, to, uh, Lord, learn deeper, Lord, learn more, Father, Lord, so that uh, we can understand, Father, how really you want us to worship you, Lord, in our spirit, in truth, Father, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunities that you give us, Father, Lord. Yes, Lord, when we consider, Lord, the things happening, Father, in different parts of the world, they don't even have the opportunity to gather, Lord. Thank you, Father, for you have given us, Lord, this privilege, Father, Lord, to gather together, Lord, to praise your name, Lord, to glorify you, Father, Lord, and yes. to learn from your word father lord we are uh, uh, lord at this time we commit father pastor roshan into your hands father thank you lord for speaking through him lord to us uh, in the in all the classes father i pray that the session father may you speak through him father may you anoint him father lord and empower him father to uh father teach us lord the uh, deeper biblical truths father lord i pray lord also for each and every student who are here thank you for bringing them and thank you lord uh, for all who are planning to join i pray father that you open our hearts that we'll be receptive father lord to your word and we obey you lord and trust in you and work Worship you, Lord, wholeheartedly. Yes, God. Yes. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Divya. Thank you for starting us up with prayer. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining in. Uh, hope you all are doing well. Hope you all are safe and, and good. Okay. Um, so, yeah, let's get started. Uh, let me get the notes up here for us. Great. Uh, so we are in chapter six on um, becoming a worshiper, right? Um, that's the chapter we've been looking at. Uh, so we finished the first half of the chapter last class in the last sessions. Uh, so we looked at uh, deeply at the differences between spiritual worship and fleshly worship. Uh, if there is true worship, that means there is also false worship. And um, uh which state of the heart is yours? Are you worshiping him in spirit and in truth? Or are you worshiping the idols that you made up for yourselves? Okay, so that's what we've looked at. And the dangers of uh, uh, idolatry, uh, idol worship or false worship. And whatnot, okay, and so we closed the last session uh, by looking at the life of Gideon. Right? From Judges chapter 6, we very briefly, without going into too much details, we see uh, that God calls him to save Israel right, uh, from the enemies, from the Amalekites and the Midianites. And before God leads Gideon into the battle, uh, into his promise, into his destiny, the first thing that God tells him to do is to break down the altars of Baal, break down the altars of false worship, even before he steps into his destiny of a, becoming a warrior. Right. So and I believe it's the same for all of us that all of us have, uh, you know, God has a plan for all of us, isn't it? Uh, he has a destiny for all of us uh, that he wants us to walk into. Um, and one of the first steps and one of the first keys in, for us to stepping into that is bringing down the altars of false worship in our lives and and seeking God for his help and his guidance for us to know uh the altars of false worship so many, many times that we, we don't even realize or know uh, that we built up altars of false worship. And we need his his uh, His light of truth to shine in our hearts for us to realize that, isn't it? So uh, that's what we looked at um, in the last class, um, spiritual worship versus fleshly worship. Okay, uh, we, we now go into the second half uh, of the chapter. Uh, an example of becoming an extravagant worshiper, uh, becoming a worshiper, becoming an extravagant worshiper. Um, so uh, one of the key scriptures mentioned there is Luke chapter 7, verse 36 to 50. Okay, We will go to the gospel of Luke. Um, 
Once again, if you've heard me speak on this chapter, you know what it is all about. Uh, I apologize because uh, you might have heard me speak on this um, many, many times, right? Um, an example of an extravagant worshiper. Um, okay, so let's take a look at Luke chapter 7, verse 36 to 50 onwards, okay? 36 to 50. Uh, Can I request uh, each, of, uh, each of us to read at, uh, four verses each, please? Anybody? Four verses each. Luke chapter 7, verse 36 onwards. Uh, if someone could start reading us. Each of us can read four verses. That would be good. Luke chapter 7, from verse 36. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in the town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Okay, thank you. And Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he replied, Say, teacher, a money lender had two debtors, one owed 500 denarii and other 50. When they were unable to repay, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, You have judged correctly. Turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give, uh, give me a kiss, but this woman, from the time I entered, must not stop kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown, but whoever has been forgiven um, little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. Okay, can you read the 49 and 50 as well? Let's finish it off. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives the sin? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Thank you, Priya. Thank you, everyone, for speaking in to read. Uh, okay, so we just read from... Verse 36 to 50, right? Almost 14 verses, um, 14, 15 verses. Um, so from, from just that first glance of going through that scripture, right? Uh, can you all just share what kind of stands out to you? From just the first time reading the passage, what stands out? What stood out? I think it's uh, for me it was verse uh, 45 where Jesus responds to Simon saying, uh, You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Yeah, so yeah. That really, uh, you know, uh, how much we take for granted sometimes. Yeah. Thanks, Tavia. Yeah. How much we take for granted. Okay. Let's make a note of that. Granted. Uh, what else, guys? Come on, come on. Just uh, unmute and feel free to speak. For me, it's verse 48, 
and Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. I think uh, she didn't even ask Jesus to forgive her sins. She came and she kept loving Jesus. And she kept wiping and kissing him. But Jesus, with all his love, he came. He knew that she's here for something. And he knows everything before we even ask him. So that's the that. Awesome. Thank you, Jafina. Lubega, I guess. I also think that uh, there is uh, these people had a, there is what we call stereotyping in communication, where you don't look at the good over what a person has done, but you judge a person before any action. So you look mm. at these people, the disciples did judge this lady because of her past. Yet mm. I think Jesus Christ uh, was judging her because of her present, not because. They just had grace on her because I, I think that God does not judge us because of our past, uh, because of our present, our future. He judges us because he loves us, because he yeah. has grace for us. No matter what we did in the past, what we do today or what we shall do tomorrow, he mm -hmm. is always in the same position, what we call the love position and the grace position. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you, Lovega. Thank you so much. Uh, very good. A anybody else? For me, what stands out is the attitude of the a woman um, in uh, forgetting who is around and who is uh, uh, doing what. Uh, she poured out herself. And uh, uh, when she's not uh, remembering men, uh, that she is a sinner or uh, what others look at her, I mean, uh, that attitude of worship touched me. Yeah, thank you, Priya. Yeah, not not uh, not thinking too much about the people around her. Yeah, awesome, awesome. I want more, guys. I want I want to hear you all more. Yeah, it's interesting. Can I share? Yes, Isaac. Please go ahead. Sorry, I thought I. Yeah, yeah for me, it's like uh, the washing of Jesus' feet was an act of cleansing, like we said. And it was an act of outpouring of her spirit in the act of worship. For me, that was outstanding because cleanliness or cleansing is part of worship in our traditional setting in the temple. Thank you. Thank you, Isaac. Thank you. OK. Anybody else? Georgia, Anita, Aradhana, Sikidno, Nikki. Uh, can I share one more thing? Sure. Thing, yeah. yeah, I also love the fact that how she is, uh, you know, um, for her, the cost of the, uh, is it, yeah, the alabaster jar? Yes. Oh, no, it was the tears portion, right? Okay, okay, yeah. I was just thinking of, like, how uh, she just surrenders, right? She is not um, the humility uh, that she exhibits there, um, even as uh, Priya was sharing, right? Uh, yeah. She's not at all concerned about uh, what is happening around her. She's just focused on the person of Jesus Christ. So, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah that's awesome, yeah. Amazing. Thank you, thank you. Just one more person. One more, one more person. Okay, can I? Yes, super, please. Uh, here, actually, I want to talk about Pharisees. And they are the leaders at that time. And maybe uh, if we think about our lives, now we are the people who are leading people to Christ. And that day, actually, Pharisees, they have invited Jesus. But Jesus has not told them that your sins has forgiven. And uh, he has also not said that uh, your faith has saved you. Right. So we as leaders also need to be very careful when we are leading people to Christ. It should not happen that other people, they will be saved and we will be in darkness. So we need to actually learn from Pharisees that we should not be like them. Mm. Awesome. Thank you, Sivu. Yeah. 
different perspectives and i'm and I, we could go through each and everybody uh, you know just just to hear the different perspectives and uh, it, it'll all be amazing right uh, so i want yeah thanks thanks guys thanks uh, for just uh, sharing your thoughts and your your perspective your view on this chapter right um like this is um this has to be one of my favorite uh, passage recorded in the bible uh, and uh, one of the things uh, also why i like luke is i mean among the gospels every gospel has its own beauty uh, you know every gospel because it's written by a person right luke is not just a random a computer given name it's it's a name of a person that resembles that means it's talking about uh, you know every person who writes have their own way you know of writing a song or a poem or saying a story isn't it it's like an artist right uh, they all have their style of saying and then if when you read through the gospels uh, very carefully like the matthew mark luke and john um uh, there are similarities uh, you know but in that similarities there's there is a touch of uh, of their personal life uh, of of the personal character of or their who they are right and uh, and luke in many ways is known as a gospel uh, as a luke uh, jesus as a friend of sinners that's how luke portrays it and and also in many ways uh luke also tries to honor and protect women in the way he writes and uh, you know his stories um the way i say that is uh, in the way he honors his if you again i think in last week's uh, mentoring hour there was a question about the difference between the, the genealogy of Jesus in in Matthew and Luke and you see Luke writes from the perspective genealogy of Mary right he connects Jesus from and he wants to you know kind of honor her you know elevate her so to speak and in here in many ways and i don't want to go into the details uh, in this passage is Luke is kind of uh, protecting the name of this person now there's a huge debate uh, again i don't want to go into the details of it about what the name of this person could be and uh, you know uh, because the name of this person is mentioned uh, in other gospels which is mary right and the debate is uh, you know is it is this a different woman or is this, is is that mary and what not so i i don't really want to get into all of that we can have the theological discussions uh, a later time but um but just looking at this one chapter right uh, without uh, i mean if for your own personal uh, you know meditation or what not okay you can read this chapter 3650 you can also read uh, please make a note of it john chapter 12 verse 1 to 7 okay john chapter 12 verse 1 to 7 and uh, the same is mentioned in mark in the gospel of mark chapter 14 verse 3 to 9 mark chapter 14 verse 3 to 9 and then in matthew chapter 26 verse 7 matthew chapter 26 verse 7 okay um i mean just like there is uh, the different groups that are divided about you know different things of the bible you know um uh, like there are different denominations and what not uh, like even eschatology for that matter right you know about the end times there are different sects different groups who believe in post tribulation pre tribulation and all of that um um thanks uh, yes divya so uh, i mean all of those references talks about the same thing of where the, uh, the woman uh, anoints uh, jesus with the perfume okay it all talks about that and um i this is what i believe okay you don't have to believe what i'm saying and i believe when you read through it uh gospels and then let the holy spirit talk to you and and with some some research as well i believe it's the same person um i believe it's mary but uh and one of the confusion that uh that kind of that that's created this divide is because uh if you read the previous chapter of luke luke chapter 6 uh, it talks about jesus is up north in israel somewhere in galilee galilee is north northern part of israel right 
uh, and uh, and every other gospels that you know john and uh, matthew and mark talks about mary of bethany which is bethany is down south of israel right so and because this thing this chapter in luke comes immediately after chapter 6 okay you know the pre- chapter 6 talks about jesus being in galilee and it's and uh, and he must i mean he must still be there so it's it not it's not possible that it's mary from bethany who's uh, you know who who anointed jesus because jesus is up in the north that's the understanding but um one of the key factors which is very important for us to understand is that the gospel of luke is not written chronologically uh while the gospel of mark is the closest to the chron- the chronological order to record events of what happened in jesus's life but so luke is everywhere right you know that that uh i don't like that <laughs> so you see but uh, you know it, it confuses the reader uh, but yeah uh, he's one moment over oh, he's over here and the other moment he's okay let me add in there you know it's it's his way of writing it's his style of writing uh but when you compare okay uh when you just do enough research you understand uh i mean i kind of believe it's the same person but let's not get there now okay um that's just a big context guys <laughs> before we just look at this text now when we look at this text um luke chapter 7 was 36 on was from 36 to 50 it's kind of divided into three episodes right from chapter from verse 36 to 38 is one scene that's scene 1 uh and from 39 to 43 is scene 2 and from 44 to all the way to 50 is another scene okay so let's look at that the first scene scene 1 36 now it says now one of the pharisees invited jesus to have dinner with him so he went to the pharisee's house and reclined at the table okay now every time we see that uh, you know with jesus travel like you know he was a preacher and teacher who went from town to town to town to town traveling preaching the gospel the good news and what not right uh, and then he would preach at the synagogues and then um, again customary to host the teacher the traveling t- teacher or the preacher in one of the houses uh, and and that's kind of what's happening here okay now jesus is being invited and if you read the gospel of john uh, in this record it says a feast was held in honor of jesus okay in honor of jesus so and that's what's happening so jesus goes to this pharisee's house uh, and uh, he reclined at the table now again going back to those days people would not sit upright like this on a nice chair at the table the round table or a beautiful square table uh, you know for dinner it says he reclined and if you've seen one of those recliners that we have in modern days is you put your feet up everything you're kind of reclining okay that's also not the way he's reclining so it's like a, a low bed uh, on the ground and so uh, if you're a right if you're right handed you'll be resting on your left shoulder with your feet stretched on the on a bed like this so he's reclining like this okay sorry guys i was just, okay and so he'll help himself uh, you know with his right hand to you know, break bread or dip it in a sauce or whatever okay so that's what's happening that's the position or the posture jesus is in he's reclined he's pretty casual he's pretty chilled out okay and this event is also like an open house uh, what what do i mean by that is when again a preacher or a teacher a rabbi or no you know from another town was in place was in their town and if he was invited everybody from that community would also come into the house they were all invited that's why it's called an open house like you know you everybody were welcomed also although there were like a separate room where the guest was actually you know uh, being hosted uh, the living room the garden area everything would you know would be filled with people who wants to come and see the rabbi uh, say hello say hi um, you know etc cetera, etc cetera. so everybody is there a lot of people are there uh, jesus is reclined at the table pharisee a pharisee has invited okay then it goes on to say verse 37 when he was reclined at the table when a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town 
in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume. Okay, let's pause. Um, so in the Bible, again, every time this sinful life is recorded, right? It's uh, the New Living Translation will tell a certain immoral life. A woman came in who lived a certain immoral life, okay? That is only pointing towards one thing, okay? That is prostitution, okay? It's like, oh, this is Bible college class. Are we supposed to be talking, mentioning those words? Bible doesn't hide anything. And if you are uncomfortable, um, I can't help you. <laughs> okay. So putting aside diplomacy, she was a prostitute who lived a sinful life. Okay. Who had lived a sinful life in that town, learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. And poured perfume on them. Okay, um, so we are still in scene one. She, uh, we need to put ourselves in her shoes, guys. Okay, all of us, okay, guys and gals. We need to put ourselves in her shoes. There is this entire town or village in this person's house. And this person is a Pharisee. It's not just another person, right? Um, he's, uh, he's the student of the word. He serves in the temple right? In a synagogue. It's a Pharisee's house. There's, there are a lot of people. What must be running through her head, her mind? Like, you know, Priya mentioned, she did not worry about people, isn't it? But just think of her, her, her journey from her house to this person's house. Uh, just passing through every individual and if she, and I'm guessing, you know, her heart is beating hard. It's pounding, you know, out of her chest. Um, and everybody in the town knows and recognizes who she is. And it is also possible that if she looked up and saw, she could recognize certain people, you know, who was involved with her. But then she puts all that aside. And she brings this alabaster jar. And something about this perfume, okay, guys, is uh, it was an imported perfume. And if you know anything about import, it's expensive, right? Another beautiful uh, fact is that this perfume was exported from the northern, northeastern part of India or Nepal. Okay, so it's made from one of the key ingredients was for, uh, a pink color flower or so, uh, which is grown in the foothills of the Himalayas. Um, then it's crushed and it's put in this beautiful jar. Okay, it's not just uh, a, like, you know, one of the glass bottles that we have now. It's, 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 it's a beautiful, beautiful and a very expensive jar. Just the jar is expensive, uh, you know, with regardless uh, with, without the perfume inside it, it's expensive. Okay, now, another historian says that this perfume was used by the temple prostitutes as well. This was used, uh, you know, to lure men in. Okay, uh, one second, guys. I, I forgot to put my phone on airplane mode. Done. Sorry. So this perfume was used to lure men to... Uh, is another word, isn't it? Seduce men into, you know. So this is the perfume that it's being talked about here as well, okay? Now, perfume was used very vastly in this culture. So I'm, I'm just showing one of the reasons. Now, if she's bringing an alabaster jar, <clears throat> uh, it was for, you know, used for this purpose as well. So she brings that jar and she stood behind his feet, weeping. She began to wet his feet with her tears. 
Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. Now, in the Gospel of Mark, when you read this passage, uh, you know, the, the, one of the, the reference that I gave, it says, she broke the alabaster jar. She does not open it. She breaks it. Okay. Now, um, if this is the jar, it's just a flask. Now, if I just opened it, uh, you know, I have control over how much I want to pour, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, so I have a glass and if I want to pour something in it, I have control over how much I want to pour. Yes or no? But when the version says that she breaks the alabaster jar, it simply means that she's not surrendering some, she's not surrendering just 90%. She's saying, I don't want to have any control over my past. She breaks it at his feet. Right? Uh, another scholar says she was giving up the trick of her trade. You know, uh, like every profession, uh, every trade has a trick, isn't it? Hey, this is the trick of my trade. You know, uh, this is what gets me more business, more success in my trade. Um, she was willing to give up the trick of her trade. She was willing... She was just saying that I am not going back to my old life. So she stood, she stood, you know, behind him, his, uh, him. She was weeping at his feet and she began to wet his feet with her tears. Um, why is tears recorded? You know, we need to ask the question, isn't it? Uh, there's so many things about the Bible, the details that it records, and we need to ask, why is it there? Why is her tears recorded? What's the big deal about her tears? Uh, you know, and the Bible says, he collects our tears in a bottle, isn't it? In one of the Psalms, I forget the Psalm, if you, if you can just you know put it in the chat section, uh, it'd be helpful. Um, he says he collects our tears in a bottle. Uh, and one of my friends, this is again go, going back to 2011. Uh, she said uh, she wrote an article um, about this. <clears throat> it says when she was worshiping him, when she just weeping at his feet with her tears, she was giving Jesus something that we cannot give him in heaven. In heaven, in Revelation, if when you read, it says uh, the day will come where he's going to wipe away all our tears, all our shame, all our pain. It's all going to be gone. So in heaven, there's not going to be any tears. And so when we worship him with our tears, in our pain, uh, in, through our sorrows, through our struggles, we are giving him something that we cannot give him in heaven. Isn't that beautiful? So is your worship costing you something that you will not be giving him in heaven? And that's why it is so precious and it's recorded. And that's now, now it makes sense. Like, thanks, Divya. It says, now it makes sense why he records our tears in a bottle. Because we are giving him something that we cannot give him in heaven. And it was a couple of weeks ago, I was speaking with one of the persons from, uh, we have a, a setup team in church, uh, right? Um, and I was talking about, it's like, hey, how are you managing? Do we have enough people for, in, in the team to help and come and set up? Uh, you know, uh, you've been doing this every week. Why don't you take a rest? Uh, his response was so casual, and but just so profound. He said, uh, no, boss, I, you know, we can't do all of this, you know, when we go, go to heaven. We were not even having like a serious spiritual talk. But out of, you know, nowhere he says, you know, we... We, we, I can't, you know, we can't do this in heaven. We get this chance here to to roll the cables, to put, you know, plug everything, to set up everything, and uh, oh man, that that hit me, hit me, you know, beautifully. And it, it, it again reminded me of this: is for us to look for ways, look for opportunities to worship Him in ways that we cannot worship Him in heaven, and that is precious. And that is what is happening here, is she breaks the alabaster jar uh, at his feet. She was willing to give up the trick of her trade. Um, and she kissed his feet, wet his feet with her tears, and wiped them with her hair. 
wipe them with her hair. Right? You guys with me? So that's scene one. Now the scene shifts from verse 39. <clears throat> yes, Priya. Yeah, we'll, we'll look at that as well. Verse 39. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, that means in his thoughts, right? If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Okay, this expectation of a prophet knowing is a valid expectation is because every prophet uh, of the old, right, were, they were known to know things. Okay, what, what is the king of Syria doing? What is the king of, you know, Israel doing? So he would know, of course, God would give him the word of knowledge and the wisdom to know. So, and that is the expectation here as well, is that if this man was a prophet, as he claims, he would know who is touching him and what kind of a man she is. Simon did know who he was hosting. <laughs> okay. Um, and then Jesus is like, hmm, okay. Simon, I have something to tell you. So S Simon must be is like, finally, you have something to say. Yes, go ahead and say, you know because she's doing something that is very awkward and inappropriate. We are all just, you know, quiet over here, you know, nudging each other. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you have something to tell. Yes, please go ahead. And he's thinking that he's going to confront. But that doesn't happen, isn't it? Uh, verse 40, Simon, Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Verse 41, two men owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and another 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. And so he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Verse 43, it says, Simon replied, I suppose the one who had a bigger debt canceled. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Okay, uh, another important, you know, why is Jesus is using this parable and where money and debt is used as an example? Again, now, once again, if you read the Lord's Prayer, or the Sinner's Prayer, as we call it, in the, in, the, in the Gospel of Matthew and in the Gospel of Luke, again, it's the same Aramaic word that's, where you, that's used for debt and sinners. Okay, so that's why when we pray, some versions say, like, forgive our debts as we forgive who uh, debts against us, right? And then uh, there's another translation that says, forgive our sins as we forgo forgive those who sin against us. So it comes from the same root word, which has two meaning, where debt is equal to sin, and sin is equivalent to debt, okay? So, uh, so Jesus is just narrating uh, the story for, to the Pharisee in the scene too. Jesus read his heart. He knew the intentions of his heart. He knew that the atmosphere was something, uh, it was not right. There's something strange about it. And then verse 44. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon. So he's looking at the woman, but he's talking to Simon. It's like an epic movie scene is happening, isn't it? He turned toward the woman, but he's speaking to Simon. And he's saying, do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet. But she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins, now, you, now we see the connection of sins and debt, isn't it? 
I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little loves little. Okay, um, again, to set the cultural context of those days is it was uh, like, you know, in the Indian culture, if, so, if a guest comes in, uh, the least we could do for, give that guest is a glass of water, right? That's uh, just hosting the guest well, that's showing our courtesy, you know? Um, so in, similarly, in their day and age, in their culture, if a guest came home, uh, it was customary to wash, uh, give water to wash their feet uh, because it would be very dusty from the travel, from the road they traveled. And it was um, also customary to kiss their hand. Okay, that was also a symbol. And also give them a little bit of perfume to, uh, you know, on the, to just put on their palm or their hands a little bit. So everything that this woman did was offensive. Her breaking the perfume was considered a waste. Why? Because it's like, hey, you don't break the alabaster jar. You don't give everything. Uh, you know, it's not that important. This guest is not that worth it. Uh, you know, but then it seems like she knew how worthy Jesus was. And so she gives it all. And then another very uh, offensive thing that she does is she lets her hair down. And so according to the Talmud, right, uh, that's one of the docs, documents of uh, the, the Hebrew people. If a woman lets her hair down and if she was married, the husband has enough uh, reason to file a divorce against her in public, if she, if she let her hair down in public. Now, obviously, she did not have to worry about that, but it was yet very offensive. Okay. Uh, and let alone, like everybody knew the fact that she was an adulterous woman and she was a prostitute. But here's the thing, guys. I just want to pause here before we conclude this se session. Is uh, another, another gospels, other references says that why this waste? Uh, it's one year's wages, right? Now, I just mentioned that this was, uh, that we all know that she's an adulterous woman. She used the perfume, it can be, could have used the perfume to uh, seduce and allure men in, you know, into prostitution as well. And so when we say that was one year's wages, how do you think she earned those wages? I hope you guys are listening to me. <laughs> How do you think she earned those wages? I will leave it at that. And so this, the act of this woman uh, is, it, she goes against everything that society, you know, that culture and the people there uh, understands about worship. She almost redefines everything. Um, and uh, in, the, in the Gospel of Matthew, it says, what this woman did, what this woman did will be in, uh, you know, will be, will be remembered wherever my Gospel is shared. It's amazing, isn't it? Uh, by, Jesus doesn't say, uh, you know, Peter will be remembered for what he did wherever my gospel is preached. Apostle Paul will be remembered. John will be remembered. All these 12 disciples will be remembered for wherever. He doesn't say that, but he says, what she did will be spoken about in memory of her. That means Jesus wanted her to be remembered. And that's... Um, and we can talk about this passage for years and years and years, and we might still not fully understand um, the depth and the beauty of what's happening here, right? And finally, in conclusion, it says that she wiped his feet with her hair. She must have come in, she did what she did, and she was going back. Now, I'm just saying it's not in the Bible, but just think about it. 
as she's walking back, as she's walking outside, I'm wondering, you know, people asking each other, hey, is that fragrance coming from the feet of Jesus or is it coming from her hair? Right? The whole room, everybody in the house, inside and out, knew that she was very intimately close with Jesus. And now the fragrance of Jesus has, that was on Jesus has been rubbed off on her with her hair. She came in, she came in as a prostitute, but she's now walking out as an extravagant worshiper. Her sins have been forgiven without her even asking, verbally asking for forgiveness. You talk about actions speaking louder than words. Uh, it seems like the right place to use, isn't it? Um, and, and so that's, that's the beauty of worship is that when you've been intimate with Jesus, the person, your friend, your family, the world, your congregation will know that you've been with Jesus because the fragrance of Jesus has been rubbed off on you. And we see Paul writing that in the book of Corinthians is that the, he is the fragrant one. And so there is this fragrance, um, you know, that is on Jesus that gets rubbed off on us when we spend that intimate time when, uh, uh, you know, with him in worship. Okay. Um, and one of the very important, uh, can we just quickly go to Matthew chapter 21, please? And I'm, I know we've just gone a minute. I'll give you an extra time for the break. I apologize. Uh, Matthew chapter 21. Hey John, I see the question. Yeah. Uh, Matthew 21, verse 31 and 32. Matthew chapter 21, verse 31. And 32. Okay. Um, let me read it for you. It says, Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. The tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. Even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. That means, it tells something that John the Baptist, as he was preaching, sinners would listen to him. And two among them were tax collectors and prostitutes would listen to his sermon, his sermon, his preaching. What did he preach? Repent for the kingdom of God is near. And then other thing he says is, I baptize you with water, but the one comes after me baptizes you, will baptize you with fire. That was his message. And they believe that. And so Jesus makes this bold statement saying, prostitutes will enter before you guys uh, because they believe. Right? And it is not a surprise when we see again in the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew, there are two prostitutes mentioned, isn't it? Rahab from Jericho, um, and then Tamar, who prostitutes herself with her father-in-law. And that is mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus. Bible doesn't hide anything. And if there's something in the Bible, that means there's something for us to learn. And that's something God wants to teach us. And I believe um, in closing of this section, um, God wants us to become an extravagant worshiper an extravagant worshiper who will come to him, who will just first take that first step and come. Bring yourself to him. Don't run away. And then break your alabaster jar. Don't just open it. Don't try to have control over it, but break it. And that is the meaning of the hymn that we sing, I surrender all, isn't it? Break it at his feet. And as you spend that intimate time with him, his fragrance will get rubbed off on you. And everybody, all your friends, your family will know that you've been with Jesus and they will know that you are a worshiper. And just like her, you will be remembered 
for, for what you are what you've done not how many meetings or crusades you've had but how much time you've spent with Jesus amen and so our students as students i want to encourage us all that we would become extravagant worshipers and that we will not hold back uh, you know everything in our worship okay um, that's uh, that's the end of this session we'll try and recap a little bit more in the next section uh, but for now i know we've gone 5 minutes overboard i apologize please take extra 5 minutes for your break and i'll see you at uh, 10:05 is indian standard time all right Take it, guys. <laughs>